Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 32. As always, my name is Mark. Here with me today is Orion. Hello. Matt. Hi. And a very special guest all the way from Houston, Texas, board game designer Trey Chambers. Hi, guys. Thanks for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Trey, for those who don't know, Trey is the designer of three games, two have released, one upcoming uh, the first one is Argent the Consortium, and then Harvest, which we really like over here, and then currently on Kickstarter, Imperial Spells and Steam. Is that correct? Spells and Steam? That's correct. Yes. Uh, yeah, and it's Imperial spelled with an E and a Y, so it's not like Imperial, like um, from an empire. Yeah, was that deliberate? Like a like wordplay pun in the title? No, um, Imperial is a is an English word. It means like... Um, from the heavens, basically. Yeah, yeah, I looked that up, but then I didn't realize until I watched the Kickstarter video that it was actually pronounced similarly. So I was like, hmm, I wonder if that was a deliberate, like, Yeah, I was homophone. avoiding pronouncing it until just now. Just yeah. now? <laughs> I've heard all kinds of pronunciations of it, which I'm not sure why people are pronouncing it differently than Imperial with an I, but, um, you know, whatever. It doesn't really matter. I've heard lots of different pronunciations of uh, consortium in Argent the consortium. Really? Heard, like, yeah, consortium is like a very common pronunciation. Yeah, I've heard that one. Yeah, huh. I think I actually looked it up, and it, it's one of those weird English words where both pronunciations is, are acceptable. So you can say consortium or consortium. So, you know, whatever. I, I didn't know that. I always, I, I knew the word beforehand. I knew it as consortium. Although I have to say for imperial... It was in my mind until I deliberately looked it up. I was pronouncing it in my mind, Empiral, which now that I look at the spelling doesn't make much sense. <laughs> I mean, Empiral sounds cool. Yeah, it sounds like a word, but it, it's like you got to cut out a letter or two to make that work with the I, spelling. I think, I, well, I mean, just as a title of the game, I think it's captured our our imaginations immediately. <laughs> I mean, all, I'm all for strange, <laughs> strange words. It's got the 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 obligatory Y to in there to communicate the fantasy setting. I can't remember who said it. There was some fantasy writer who was like, yeah, fantasy and sci-fi is where authors go to use their uh, leftover Ys and Zs <laughs> that they don't get to use in normal writing. <laughs> But yeah, we're going to have a little chat today, I guess, uh, run down the games that you've designed and capture really the heart of who you are. That's that's the ultimate goal. Man, and it's only going to take an hour. There's not much to me, I guess. <laughs> but let's start off the top. What got you into board gaming? Like, what was your introduction there? What got you hooked? Are you talking about hobby board gaming or just board gaming in general? How about both? <laughs> uh, okay. Well, um, I've always been a big fan of board games, starting from when I was a kid. My parents used to play them with us. Funnily enough, neither of them plays board games like at all now, but when they were young and I was a kid, they used to love board games, and so we'd have game nights and play games. Even Risk, like they used to play Risk, and that was probably the first game that I was super excited about, but they would never let me play because they would say I was too young. Then finally, I, I turned like 10 or 12 or something, and they finally let me play Risk with the adults. And that was literally the last time they played. They played it one more time. <laughs> Not only that, the one time I got to play with them, they eliminated me in the first 30 minutes. Like, literally, all the adults ganged up on me and killed me. And they're like, uh, okay, now go to your room for the next five hours. Yeah, exactly. I was pretty pretty not happy with that, especially since I never got a chance to redeem myself. And now my parents would never look sideways at risk. Like, it's hard to even get them to play party games. So oh. it's weird how it works. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but I enjoy playing board games with my friends. And then high school and college, I hardly played board games at all. Like, maybe at a couple of parties. So I pretty much fell off the map with board games. And uh, obviously, I was not aware of hobby gaming at all. This is one of those things where, like, Catan was really well-known in Germany, but uh, in America, not really. But then I had some friends that I made that introduced me to Catan because they found out about it in college somehow. And they played Catan with me and I, I was totally hooked. And we played Catan like several times a week until we burned out on it, which took like several months. And now I never want to touch Catan again, but that's fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then uh, so I was like, well, there, th this can't be the only game like this. There has to be other interesting board games 
other than Settles of Catan. And so I did some research, and I just Googled and stumbled upon BGG. Once I found BGG, I was like, okay, well, let's start – let's look at these list of the top 100 games, and let's start, you know, buying some of them. So, you know, like old-fashioned style, way before Amazon or anything kind of took over, I went down to the comic shop and, like, bought – copies of Agricola and Ticket to Ride and Galaxy Trucker. That's a, Sorry, that's a solid starter back there. Yeah, really. Yeah. Sorry, I, I unintentionally skipped over Carcassonne. We played Carcassonne for like a month, but then we burned down that too. <laughs> and then I, bought, I, I, then I bought those three games at a comic shop. And so I loved all of them except Ticket to Ride, which I still don't understand Ticket to Ride <laughs> or why it's popular, but that's fine. And uh, like Agricola, obsessed with Galaxy Trucker, was awesome. Played the heck out of both of those games. And then after that, it just kind of graduated. You know, I became a quote-unquote addict, as they say. And just kept buying more games, playing more games. That's great, yeah. That's a good set to pick up. I think when I got to that point where I was like, okay, let's look at the top 100 games and then pick one, you know, that's high on the list, I went with Puerto Rico. And that was was a bit droll to start with. Yeah, that's what you got (laughs) me as a... um present for being in your wedding yeah yeah that's right we played it at your bachelor party did we play no it was before then we played an rpg at my bachelor party oh no 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 the, like the one in california the night before you oh that's right the impromptu one I yeah we played poker that night we might have played poker oh. too i don't yeah. i don't think i've ever actually played puerto rico and i think you'll never play but, it again, but yeah so. definitely drier than the games you mentioned like yeah no, i wish i'd gone with i Galaxy wish i knew Trucker. that there was humor <laughs> In board gaming with Galaxy Tracker before. I think for yeah. us, the big first one was Catan and then probably Dominion. Yeah, Dominion was what got me into it. Oh, yeah. Dominion was one of the first games I picked up as well. Yeah. That game, you know, it was like we were blown away by it the first few plays, but it the, the base set gets old pretty quickly. So when the expansions came out, it was more interesting. But hmm. yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's always fun to see how people kind of got got the uh the what's the word i'm thinking of bug. the bug yeah the bug what got them into it uh what are your, some of your favorite games currently uh well lately i've been playing the heck out of gaia project Ooh, um, nice yeah it's a really good refinement of the terra mystica systems i i still waffle back and forth on which one is the better game like i'm really into gaia project right now but that's because i played the heck out of terra mystica like probably 30 to 50 games in person and over 100 online, so I'm kind of burnt out on Terra Mystica. Um, so I don't know if Guy Project has that same longevity, but it's really compelling so far. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah, and then Gloomhaven, we're like a third through our cam- campaign on Gloomhaven. That's, That's a really good game. We, we burned out on that one, too, so we had to put it away for a while because we were playing like nothing but Gloomhaven, and finally we were just like, okay, we have to pause the campaign because it's getting a little, little crazy. So those have been the two main games. I've been playing a lot of Unlock games going through that series of exit games and then just tons of games like i'm big into new games so (laughs) i like to just try new games even if i only play it once so we play a lot of different games i recently got clank in space but we haven't tried it yet but it's that's this weekend nice nice that's fun i think it's an improvement on clank yeah i've i have played clank so it wasn't a blind buy like i tend to do tons of research before i purchase games um because i try to keep a small collection of games that hits the table often but I, I've played Clank, and I really like the system. What I didn't like about Clank is the static board. And so I was oh, like, yeah, oh, yeah. well, this is the same mechanism, which I really like, but it's a modular board, so hopefully there'll be more replayability. Yeah, yeah, I think there would be. I've only played it a couple of times. Did you guys have the uh, the problem with Gloomhaven that I've called the uh, Affliction of Gloomhaven table, where you set it up, and then it never leaves the table? Like, it just remains set up for yeah. weeks? Well, that's why we haven't we haven't played it in a while because basically if it's out, it's gonna stay out, and I'm not gonna pick it up because yeah. <laughs> yeah, it takes like a good thirty minutes to pack away and I thirty know. minutes to take back out. So I was like, well, screw that. Um, while we're doing the campaign, it's gonna be out. But once I put it up, it's up for a while, you know. But we're getting to the point where I'm I'm ready to bring it back out, and then it'll probably sit on my table all summer while we <laughs> try to get through uh, as much of the campaign as we can before yeah, we burn yeah. out again. Have you guys retired any characters yet? Yeah, I've, I'm on my third character, and some of the other people in my party are on their second, because I don't play with the same people every week. That's the beauty of that game, is that you can just add and drop players willy-nilly, which I wish more legacy games were designed around. So I've actually played with like 10 or so different people, maybe as many as 12 to 15 different people, 
in my copy of Gloomhaven, and everybody has their own characters, and it's really easy to keep track, and so it's really great. But um, since I'm the only one in every single game, I'm the only one who's retired more than one character. Yeah, yeah. it's That part of Gloomhaven is, is remarkable, like how well they did that. Yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. it's great. So at some point, you get addicted to, to modern board gaming, and then at some point... You're like, okay, I got to design a game. How did that begin? What got you to the point where you're like, okay, I'm going to actually make one of these things? So actually that began when I was a kid. Like I used to design um, pencil, like uh, board games on pencil and paper. They were basically glorified mazes, I'd call them. Very and true. they would resemble like uh, Nintendo levels. So like Zelda or Mario levels. And I'd have my little friends go through them with a pencil and like they'd if they discovered a treasure or a um, in a in a Mario level, if they hit a um, question mark box, I'd tell them what they discovered and things like that. So I already you know had the mind for designing games when I was a kid, but I never really kind of did anything with it because I didn't know how. And then uh, I wanted to design video games, but programming is just not something that interests me. So I was like, well, I have like the mind for game design, but I don't want to program. So it's really hard to get into the video game industry if you know nothing about programming, like literally nothing. So the board game thing happened just by happenstance. I was at a friend's house on a normal game night, and he had these really nice player aids that were printed on cardboard. Like they looked professionally done. And I was just like, the game was for Lost Valley. So like the old version of Lost Valley did not have player aids, and the game really needs player aids. So he made his own player aids by... um, printing it on label paper and then just stickering it to cardboard and then spraying it down with an adhesive. And he taught me how to do that. And once I had that knowledge, I was like, oh, that's really easy. I can make my own board game using that. And that's what I did. And then I just started making board games after that. So it was just like a random interaction that led to all of it. Just the the, the ease of actually physically making it. Uh, just yeah. Just realizing how easy it would be to make my own prototypes. That's all I needed. Like once I knew that, I just hit the ground running. Was Argent the first design you kind of seriously pursued? It was uh, the second. The first one, I still want to get published one day because it's basically the very first game I designed. No, no, I take that back. The um, the first serious game I tried to, to work on and, and have people publish is like um, Werewolf, but with a board. Sort of similar to Battlestar Galactica, but I designed it way before Battlestar Galactica came out. So like each player is like a pawn in the village. And um, so you have to gather enough food for the winter, but at the same time, a werewolf is going out and like killing the characters every night. That was actually a pretty cool game, and maybe I'll go back to that design one day. But that was the first game that I that I actually pitched to some publishers, and the publishers did not like it. And it, I can understand why it wasn't a very polished game. But you know, maybe one day I'll go back and polish it. And then I designed a, a blacksmithing game that was basically like uh, at the gates of Luoyang, but about blacksmithing. And that game, I think, it's it kind of improves upon all the weaknesses of At the Gates of Liang, but I just haven't picked it up in a while. So I want to work on that one eventually and get that one published because I think it's a really solid game. And then uh, Argent was like the third serious game I worked on. Okay, nice, nice. Yeah, because I wondered because it's... I don't know much about Argent, but it has been recommended to me by a couple of different people. as like, oh, you would like this game. And then the other comment they always make is, but it's more complicated than you think. I'm like, okay, that's that's interesting for a first time design to have a game that's, you know, of a moderate to high complexity. Because when I think, you know, I have far fetched ideas of trying to design a game someday, and I'm like, well, I'll start with the simple idea first, and then maybe try to go into something more complicated. So tell me about Argent. Like I said, I don't know much about it other than that it's it's worker placement. What's kind of the the the, the highlights of the, of that game? So um, what's really unique about Argent, and still there's, I think it was the first to do this, but there still aren't very many games on the, worker placement games on the market that do this, but basically all of your workers have different powers, and not not just like uh, in Manhattan Project where they can go to different areas or whatever, be used for different things, but the actual workers each have a different power according to what color they are, and at the beginning of the game, you draft them according to the strategy you want to pursue. So you can get like defensive mages, you can get utility mages, you can get offensive mages, and those are your workers. And uh, according to their color, they each have like a special ability when you play them. Okay, interesting. So yeah. that's like the big thing. The other cool thing, my probably, that's like the main selling point of the game, I think, to set it apart from other worker placement games. 
But um, a lot of people also like that it's not a victory point game. You actually are competing for 10 different voters and whoever – they're like kind of criteria, right? And whoever fulfills the most criteria at the end of the game wins. So um, it's unique in that aspect because most worker placement games are victory point games. And then there's my favorite aspect, which is the spells. So you represent an actual character in this universe, and you, you can develop a personal tableau of spells. So not only do your workers have special powers, but you have your own set of special powers that you can cast, and they do a myriad of things. I think the base game shipped with like 50 or 60 different spells, um, and then there's an expansion that adds even more spells. So there's all these different spells you can learn and, and use in the game. It's pretty pretty awesome. Yeah, that sounds really cool. I think I've only... Other than the little module in Tuscany, I think the only time I've played a worker placement game with individual abilities was when we played Three Kingdoms Redux. Yeah, that's what I was thinking when you said unique uh, worker placement. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's a really cool idea. I'm surprised we don't see more games that do that. Yeah, Tasty Minstrel actually just released one called the Chimera Project, I think, or something. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. You, like, add pieces onto your worker, and each piece you add gives them uh, an extra special ability. So, um, yeah, kind of similar to that, I guess. There's So there's a few on the market now. I, I want to say Arjun was the first to come out, but I'm not positive. But mm-hmm. I certainly wasn't taking it from anywhere. I, it's just an idea I had because I loved Agricola, and I was like, um, how cool would it be if your farm workers in Agricola each had their own, like, personal ability or something that they're extra good at? Um, and then I just kind of took that concept and made Argent. Yeah, that's really neat. And uh, I guess speaking of Agricola, we we can now move to Harvest, which I do know about because we have it sitting right here in front of us at the moment, which I think pretty clearly borrows from games like Agricola, but then compacts it down to like 45 minutes. Was that kind of the goal from the beginning? Like, I want to make a 45-minute Agricola? Yeah, um, absolutely. So, like, my goal with Harvest was... Uh, kind of twofold. One, I wanted to take the experience of Agricola because I love in Agricola just building my own farm and just kind of developing that engine where it's different and unique from what the other players are doing. But I wanted to condense that experience into like, you know, a 10 to 15 minute per player experience. So that was goal one. And then goal two was, you know, Argent was very, you know, pretty heavy and complex. So the market was going to be pretty niche. So I wanted to design something that I thought had broader appeal. And our, uh, Harvest is really easy to teach and to play. So it work, It works on that level. I just think there were so many games that come out now, it kind of slipped under the radar, but I think it has mass appeal. You know, yeah, I would more completely people will agree. discover it. That's what we thought. I mean, when, when we were going through your top 100 games mark this year, I think my comment was this is a game that has kind of a place in most collections. Oh, yeah. I, I Yeah, I completely agree. And I'm surprised I haven't seen it around more you know people talking about it more because i i kept trying to like you know push it and promote it so i'm like hey this is a really cool game and it's surprisingly short and fits a lot in there and there wasn't a whole lot and i'm i'm a a bit surprised because it is super accessible in that way yeah i mean if you figure it out let me know because (laughs) i mean uh even like tom vassal made a video about it and gave it a seal of excellence and like tens of thousands of people have watched that video and yet very few people uh, have played the game, so I don't know. Oh, wow. Um, I didn't know you got the the high rating from from them. Yeah, yeah. He he really loved it. So, you know, I was I was really happy about that. Funnily enough, he only gave uh, Argent the seal of approval, and it was I was like, Argent's definitely going to be up his alley, but he was he said it, like, took up too much table space, and I was like, uh, don't you like Caverna? Like, <laughs> it takes up <laughs> at least the same space as Caverna. But uh, yeah, he really loved Harvest. I, the only thing I can think of is that just too many games are coming out now that like even really solid designs can kind of go you know unnoticed. Yeah, I mean, I think that's you know with was it three thousand new releases a year that's going to happen. Even if you know ten percent of those are notable in any way, that's about one a day that you would want to you know keep up with at least knowledge of if you're going to be up on board gaming. So there's a there's a lot of room for games to slip under the table, but it'll it'll keep appearing on lists and stuff from me. I, I really like Harvest. Trey, the biggest question I had with Harvest was um, like uh, obviously it condenses kind of the Euro experience engine building into a very uh, a shorter kind of streamlined experience. At what point in the design process was having these unique roles 
important. Was that something that you you wanted from the beginning, or just something that you realized um, made sense later on? So the developer on Harvest was Seth Jaffe. I don't know if y'all know him, but uh, yep. he's famous for um, Eminent Dom- Domain and uh, a few other games. We just had um, uh, last week a nice hearty argument about Eminent Domain. Oh, nice. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, he's a you know he's a a really good designer and a really awesome developer and. I th- I want to say he was the first to suggest it. Once he suggested it, I kind of ran with it because uh, I was like, that that is a brilliant idea. Originally, I built in the replayability um, uh, from the buildings and the different right. action cards, you know, because those are going to be different every game. But then when he suggested the unique player powers, I was like, oh, that's going to add even more replayability. Sure. That's like the main thing I focus on in my designs is because I there's so many games that I think are good, like. For instance, every Lacerda game I've ever played, I really enjoyed it. But after like playing it three times, I just I'm done with it, you know, because <laughs> they all kind of played out the same, kind of the same for a lot of stuff and fell games and various other games. And so like what I try to focus on in my designs is like games that y- it could hit the table the next night and be like a totally different experience. Mm-hmm. So anything that can add to that, I try to add it in. So when he suggested variable player powers, I was like, yes, variable player powers. And actually, they were originally kind of minor bonuses. But I kind of leaned into it. I was like, <laughs> no, let's let's make it like Marco Polo. Because to me, the interesting part about Marco Polo is like the powers are so OP, but they're all like equally OP. So that was my design goal with the player powers in Harvest. I was like, yes, they're all going to be OP, but let's make them you know, equally OP and then it'll be fine. Yeah, the first game that came to mind when I was thinking of comparing it is is vast, which makes no, I mean, mm. they're, they're I mean, u- utterly different games, but it's just like really asymmetrical how... It's not that asymmetrical. It's not, but it's it's like it's like a step below Cosmic Encounter. <laughs> like Cosmic Encounter is like the the extreme, I think, and then Harvest. Maybe I just had best on the mind, but yeah, I I love how everyone at the table is just that kind of like cycle. The engine cycle is just different for everyone. Yeah, it has OP, yeah. OP powers. Yeah, which I yeah. think has the side effect of like just allowing or kind of nudging people towards different styles. Or different strategic paths that you might have, that still might have been available without variable powers, but it kind of says, hey, try this, and you'll be surprised at how it works. Because I think a lot of times, you know, people get into the rut of assuming a certain strategic path, or like, these two paths are the only way you can win this game, and that's not necessarily true. If you're kind of forced into something you wouldn't have tried before. I think it can help you understand the game a bit better. Yeah, I, you know, I just want the experiences to be different. And, you know, Vast does it in a really cool way. Um, There's some problems, I think, in the Vast design, but I heard the expansion kind of helps. But I really like the idea behind Vast of just having, like, every player is totally different. And I'm actually kind of doing something similar with the game I'm working on now. It's a co-op game where, like, all the different players have wildly different, like, abilities and play styles. And I think that'll be good. We'll see. Yeah, I think actually, I think that ports really well to co-op where you have, I mean, like in the real life, you have the idea of a team. And oftentimes, if you have a diverse set of people who have different skill sets in the team, it just works better. So it seems natural that a game where that is simulated would work well. Yeah, yeah. What uh, Spirit Island, which is one of my favorite games, has taught me about co-ops is like, Co-ops don't have to be perfectly balanced because you're all on the same team. So uh, <laughs> it, the, you don't get that like bad taste in your mouth when like a player has like a power that's way better than yours because, hey, they're on your team with that OP ability. So you're just kind of like cheering them on. So, uh, you know, I think having a game be co-op solves a lot of those issues. When you when you develop a game that's like high variability between powers and uh, has a lot of asymmetry, um, if it's going to be a co-op, it's just going to be a lot easier to manage balance-wise. Uh, because if it's a competitive game, you you really have to get the balance down. Otherwise, people it could be a really fun game mechanically, but people are really going to you know have problems with it. Uh, like my biggest problem with Terra Mystica is that like some of the races are just imbalanced. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's that's sad with Terra Mystica, especially on the bottom end. Like, what is the fakirs and the giants are yeah, generally those considered are the bad. worst. Yeah. And it's like, well, now that I know that and I've played with them, I'm just never going to choose them, ever. Yeah. Oh, just since you mentioned Spirit Island, I'm glad there's another Spirit Island fan here. Because I've seen, like, and this is completely off topic, but I'm going to roll with it. 
it keeps getting left off of award lists. Why? I don't know. <laughs> it's so good. What uh, what awards was it looked over for? What was I looking at? The Origins nominations? Not not a single mention. And they put like 10 to 15 games on each of their categories for the nominees. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a big oversight because it, it did very well on uh, like uh, it's in the top 100 on Borgagi already. Yeah. So Dice Tower Awards, the nominees, it was on there, I think, fairly, and and BGG. But I can't remember, there was like one or two others other than Origins that seemed fairly significant that it was left off of, and I I don't understand at all. We love Spirit Island a lot. Yeah, yeah, it's my favorite co-op by far. Back to your games. I'm, I'm curious with trying to make a game that kind of fits into a short period of time, is was that... A challenge to say, okay, I just have to trim it here and here and here because the the playtime is so important. Or did you kind of, were you were you flexible with with playtime goals? I suppose. Um, I think designing short games is actually pretty easy. The um, what's harder is designing long games that justify their length. Oh uh, um, yeah, because there's always ways you can uh, adjust the parameters of a game to trim it down. So you know, I like. I think at some point Harvest was six rounds and I just like literally just chopped a round off and it didn't really affect much. And it just, it felt like a better play length. So we just went with that. And I, I think I made some minor adjustments, but for the most part it was the same game. So like there's, there's usually pretty easy ways to fiddle with the length of your game. It's just the longer your game is, the more you have to justify it taking up, you know, that, that amount of time really. That's interesting. I, I, I didn't think, I haven't thought about it that way before. We've mentioned that in analyzing games, but not from a design perspective. Yeah, but usually we're complaining about games being too short. Oh, I yeah. Remember, well, I remember games where we've said you don't get enough game for the time that it takes. Yeah, that's that's that, fair. That's yeah. kind of the, the same comment. I've had that criticism before, for yeah. sure. Or at least for the the setup I'm looking at. I just, I just saw Command & Colors Ancients on the uh, shelf. Like, there's a game I'd play more if it didn't take forever to set up. Yeah. There's a lot of games like that. Yeah, sadly. Okay, and then the most important question, I think, about Harvest. At what point were the wooden poop pieces added? Because I think it's a, it's the greatest thing ever. <laughs> I mean, that was all, They were always going to be poop. It really was just up to TMG. Like, I didn't, I didn't handle the component end of things. And TMG was like, we're going to have poop meeples. And I was just like, great. That's better. <laughs> Because um, I think in my prototypes, I just had them as brown cubes, and we still called them poop, but they were just brown cubes. And then they were like, no, we're going to make poop meeples. And I was like, uh, that's great. <laughs> that's, it's amazing. I love them so much. And I love how, like, in the rule book, it's like, this is these are fertilizer tokens. I'm, oh, come on. <laughs> it looks yeah. just like the poop emoji on your phone. <laughs> I don't think anyone calls them fertilizer, but, yeah. you know, that's what they are in the rule book. The uh, game's got, I mean, a wonderful kind of whimsical character throughout, so. Yeah. Yeah, one of my friends who, um, Harvest is one of his favorite games, and that's his favorite part about it, is, like, he loves that it's, it doesn't take itself too seriously, which was, you know, that's that's mostly on TMG. I don't really have much to do with, like, the theming of games, so mm-hmm. they added all that whimsy to it, and I'm glad they did. Like, I think the Harbor universe was a really good kind of setting for it. It being a shorter game, so it's not going to need to be as serious as something like Agricola. So I think that was definitely the right call by them. Yeah, I would agree. Plus, it, plus it allows you to justify the kind of crazy player powers by yeah. having you know it be like was there is there a, like a wizard in there and a troll and all kinds of craziness to match the mechanical craziness. Yeah, it was. Um, now that I did add the magic part, it might have been on their suggestion though. I don't remember, but um, the original design did not have any magic whatsoever. It was just kind of like Agricola in thirty minutes. That was the elevator pitch. And then at some point, I added the magical elixir and some magic buildings. And once that, those were in, then the fantasy elements were present. And then uh, you know they just kind of played it up with some of the abilities and whatnot. Yeah, that, that's that's really cool. Let's let's move on to the game. That has been funded successfully on Kickstarter already, which I'm sure was a huge release. It didn't it fund in like the first day? 25 hours. I missed it by one hour. Oh, just a little bit. Uh, and that's Imperial Spells and Steam. For some reason, every time I read it, I, I, I say in my head, Spells and Stream. But then I realize that that makes literally no sense. <laughs> 
Spells and Steam, which is a trained game, but a fantasy one. And my first question, just to kind of understand it a bit more, we haven't gotten into like train games yet. We're close, but like the whole 18xx or Steam or whatever, is this, is Imperial along those lines, like in that subgenre? Or is it an engine building game that just happens to involve trains? Good question. It's really, it's hard for me to say like what game it most resembles because it is, I think, pretty unique. It's an action selection game and your main action selection selection mechanism is a type of rondelle. It's like a customizable rondelle, basically. Oh, interesting. Uh, and it does have network building, but, you know, what train game doesn't, you know, most of them do. Uh, so it's it's network building, action selection, and pick up and deliver. I mean, I guess it most resembles Steam because, like Steam, you have to figure out how to get over these different terrains. It's just instead of paying a cost, instead you're trying to uh, mess with your rondelle to do it the most efficient manner. So, like, certain parts of your rondelle can build over certain terrains, and that's kind of how you do it. So it, it's very different from Steam, but I, I guess Steam is the closest analogy, but it's really not very much it's like its Steam. own thing. And when you say customizable rondelle, are those is that a centralized rondelle for everyone, or does each person have their own individual one, like in I don't know Trajan or something like that? No, um, they are you know asymmetrical player powers, of course. So um, each player board has their own rondelle, and all the rondelles are different. Oh, interesting. And then, of course, it's set in the fantasy Indines world from level ninety nine. Was that the intention from the beginning or is that something that brad kind of added on once uh he picked up the game it was always designed as a fantasy game but he uh he is the one who added the endings version so like i designed it it was actually called fantasy rails to start with Mm -hmm. and i always intended it to be set in a fantasy universe that was kind of just a placeholder name but you know it depends on what company picks it up and what ips they have access to Uh, i'm glad a lot, of, a lot of companies actually were looking at Fantasy Rails, including TMG, because they thought, you know, it was a cool concept. And uh, when Brad picked it up, he was just like, hey, this will fit well in Indians. And I'm like, yes, that's what Indians needs is some steampunk. So let's go. <laughs> that's great. What's kind of the the target for this game? Because, again, like I, I don't have a lot of experience with train games and i always conceive of them as something kind of intimidating to get into but this one seems more along the lines of kind of a medium weight euro is that kind of the target demographic yeah it's not it's not very complicated it's there's a lot going on but it's not complicated to learn or complicated to play so it's i think it's a medium heavy game brad thinks it's a medium light game i think he's crazy (laughs) i think i think most people would call it a medium heavy game but uh you know for whatever reason brad thinks it's like the simplest game in the world but you know i he's just really good at it i think his brain really grocks what's going on do people still say grok i don't know but um i just read dune for the or sorry not dune uh the book that word was invented for stranger in a strange land for the first time so it's been temporarily part of my I've vocabulary you say it like three times in the past month or something i don't even I like i don't even like the word that much but it's that that book invented the word and it's like three times a page someone says it but anyway yeah it's like once you read that book you can't stop saying it because they say it so many times in that book yeah, they say it, it all the time like, yeah it, it just sneaks into your vocabulary it becomes like a permanent synonym for understand yeah yeah <laughs> even though the whole point of the book is that it's it's this like mystical much deeper concept than that yeah no that does not matter um, <laughs> it uh yeah but uh so yeah his brain just kind of understands the game in a way that most people's do not even me like i have more trouble understanding my own game than he does like so for whatever reason uh he thinks it's a really simple easy game and i'm like nope no it's not it's pretty you know brain burny but it's a brain um, burning you, know, you only in... take one action on your turn so turns move actually really swiftly okay is cool good. so is it is it complex in kind of an engine building trying to find the best route through the optimization puzzle is it a lot of blocking on the on the central board what what makes it more complex to you it's so there's I guess two big things is um, one is figuring out the best choices to optimize your portfolio. Your company portfolio is made up of your um, your rondelle, plus you have a special player power. Then there's these specialists you can hire, which are like permanent abilities. 
um, that do various things. Uh, so choosing which ones to draft out of those is very difficult. Then you have your your train cars, which you are adding to your player board that adds to your rondelle. So it's like adding additional actions to your rondelle, and you also get to draft those. So selecting those is pretty uh, difficult as well. So you have all of these different choices to add to your player board to make your strategy better, to make your engine better, and so that can get you know really difficult um, as far as making a decision. And then of course there's mapping out your routes. Um, so it's you know it's finding the most efficient way across the map, what goods are you going to go for, which ones can you deliver before your opponents. You know, these are all not trivial opponent uh, puzzles to most people, but to Brad, he's like, you know, whatever. He just gets it <laughs> naturally, I guess. Yeah, yeah. That happens sometimes. Usually not with me. I don't usually get games very well. Or at least it takes me a while, I suppose. Yeah. But luckily, the... Um, the mechanisms are actually really easy. So, like, teaching the game is really simple. The game's really easy to learn. Um, it's just, you know, a little little difficult to figure out some of the strategies. When I read your BGG description of, of, of the game, I was wondering if there were, like, stock options on other trains, and I was thinking, like, is this, like, a complex train game in, in the line of, like, Tokyo Metro we played at a recent convention and stuff like that. But it sounds like it's more you're building up your own kind of company. Uh, it's not like you're investing in others. Yeah, we had stocks for a really long time, and then we took them out. Actually, the original design didn't have stocks. We added stocks in because just the, the pick up and deliver was a little too simple as far as scoring, and so we added stocks in. But then eventually... We developed the pickup and deliver part uh, more so that um, it, you know, was it made more sense as a scoring mechanism. And then at that point, we took the stock market out again because we it felt unnecessary and like wasn't really connected to the game that much anymore. Yeah, Imperial sounds sounds really interesting, and, and obviously the it, the world and the art looks so good. Yeah, honestly, Those like colors. Just looking at it, that's one of the things that excites me most. We haven't played train games. But, I mean, just as the hobby progresses, there's kind of a mixing of, of, of themes, and it doesn't have to be like... In this case, it doesn't have to be like a, a Western austere train setting um, to be a train yeah. game. So that's that's really cool. I mean, I, I feel like that's going to bring us in, and, and hopefully uh, we'll do the same for others in the hobby. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and setting it in a fantasy world really opens up what you can do with, like, powers and stuff, because you don't have to worry about realism. You're just like... This works because magic. Yep. A wizard did it. Exactly. <laughs> so I, I have to ask, although it's probably a little bit unfair, of your three designs that uh, that we've talked about, is there one that is a favorite of yours that you would choose over the others? I kind of waffle back and forth because they're all good in different ways, and they're all very different games. Like uh, Even like the length, like Arjun is three hours, and Imperial is like an hour to two hours, depending on the player count. And, you know, Harvest is like, I can do a two player game of Harvest with my daughter in like 15 minutes because we're both fast players and we played it a lot. So, you know, like, and, and the weight is kind of the same thing. It's like Harvest is really light, uh, Imperial is more medium and Argent's definitely on the heavier side. So it's, it's, uh, they're so different. It's hard to, to say one because they fill very different niches. The one I'm on right now is Imperial because I've just been playing a lot of it and, um, I'm not getting sick of it. In fact, every time I play it, I think I like it a little more, which I think is a good indication for a game. Yeah, that's a great sign. Because usually, you know, you hear about people, by this point at least, when it's, you know, on the Kickstarter, people are like, oh, I'm so sick of my game. <laughs> I'm never going to play it again. No, I mean, there's just, there's so much to it. And plus, there's all the expansion content. We haven't even really announced much of it yet. And so there's just all these different ways to play and different combos to try and different player powers. So, like, every game is very unique because it's, like, you build a totally different engine. Um, and, and they're not, like, minor differences. They're, like, huge differences um, in what you're doing. So it's really nice. That's really cool. How does that feel as a game developer that you know you're sitting on all this other content that didn't make it into the base game? I mean, are you just excited, that, hoping that the Kickstarter succeeds so you can, can release expansions in the future? How does that feel? Yeah, um, so... We actually are unlocking the expansion uh, if it hits 250. So uh, hopefully, or not 250, sorry, 150. Um, 250 is the goal I really want to get to because that unlocks extra player powers for each company. Ooh, nice. Um, yeah, that's 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 my number one goal. Is like we need to get to 250. If we get to 250, I'll be happy. But yeah, it is it, it is kind of sad because I don't 
I don't think we're going to hit all of our stretch goals we have planned, and some of them were modules that we developed that I think would be a lot of fun, but we're just not going to unlock them, so we won't be able to put them into the game. So maybe in the future, you know, if, especially if Imperial does well and sells a lot of copies in retail or whatnot, if it even makes it to retail, because they're talking about maybe not even doing retail copies. But if it does well, uh, maybe they can make it into a future expansion. But I'm pretty sure we're going to get the first expansion unlocked because we only need like um, less than 40,000 more to get that unlocked. Okay, great, great. Well, I wish you luck with unlocking more of that. What is You talked a little bit before about designs that you have kind of tucked away and haven't completed yet, but what, what's next for you in terms of design? Is there something you're, you're working on kind of in later stages? Yeah, so I'm going to have at least one game ready for Gen Con to show off to publishers, and that's the, uh, the one I referenced earlier. It's like a co-op asymmetrical game kind of ex- inspired by Spirit Island, but it's kind of more like... Whereas um, Spirit Island was more like a Euro kind of co-op. Mine's kind of the Ameritrash take on Spirit Island, basically. And Eric's actually a really good friend of mine. So um, I'll be showing it to him, hopefully at some point, and he can give me his feedback. But uh, yeah, it's 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 kind of like a co-op game. It's it's in a fantasy setting, and you're basically fighting back against like these dark forces that are encroaching on the board. Um, similar to like the uh, explorers in um, Spirit Island. Mm-hmm. But uh, in, th- in this case, like... They're different, like, fantasy races. So, like, the first one I'm developing is, like, zombies. So, like, these zombies are, like, coming in. And then, you know, each player is, like, a different fantasy kingdom with, like, totally asymmetrical abilities and different ways they even play the game. Like, even the base game mechanic is different for each race, kind of, like, vast. Okay, Uh, cool. So, yeah. So, Mm -hmm. whatever side you play, you're going to be having a very different experience from everyone else at the table. And they all, like, excel at different things obviously um like the, there's a dwarven race the dwarves are really good at defense and building buildings and things like that so uh just trying to make it as asymmetrical as possible and also like with different powers that you can get kind of like spirit island in that respect because you know i love in spirit island there's like this huge deck of power cards and you never know which ones you're going to get over the course of a game mm-hmm. so that's cool yeah asymmetry seems to be kind of a, a feature of, of your designs is that probably going to factor into pretty much anything you do oh definitely like um like I mentioned earlier, I, I don't like games where you play it like three times and then it never really changes. Uh, it's like you just you kind of experience every part of the game in those three plays and there's nothing really left to discover. Those are the kind of games that I don't keep in my collection. They might be they might be solid designs mechanically, but I'm just going to get bored with them after just a few plays. So I try to make sure all of my games are ones that are going to be compelling every single time you pull them out. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. I, I love... I, I It seems like it's, it's our harder design challenge to some degree but i think it's it's incredibly rewarding when you have all the different ways to uh kind of customize and and i guess it gives you a little bit more of a sense of agency in the game i think when you have something that you can do that other people can't do yeah yeah which is neat that's that's another reason and then uh i wanted to do a quick shout out to your podcast because you have a podcast called eternally bored uh, which focuses on kind of heavier social ideas around the gaming community, which uh, I listened to a portion of one of the episodes and it was really good. For the listeners of this one, you might want to check that out. How, how has that been received so far? Because I think it's the only gaming podcast I know of that tries to really f- focus on those kinds of topics. Yeah, that was um, that was kind of the whole idea behind it because there's so many game podcasts and like the gaming community is really great, but I think a lot of gaming podcasts don't want to, they kind of like avoid those issues on purpose, but we were like, you know, there's, there's plenty of discussion online and on Facebook and on Twitter about these issues. Uh, but there's not really any like media podcasts or anything kind of that really delves into them. So that was kind of the idea behind it is like, Hey, you know, we'll, we'll talk about the topics that, you know, no one else will. Cause I think, that those kinds of conversations, as long as they're done constructively, can be beneficial to the community. So that was yeah, our idea. Yeah, absolutely. It. Yeah, when I was thinking about this podcast, I, I briefly thought about kind of having that focus, and I've done a we've done a couple episodes on kind of community topics around the board gaming world, but I, I didn't think I would have enough to talk about, I suppose. But I, I'm really glad to see that uh, there's a podcast out there that that does try to tackle the the more difficult issues. That's that's great. Yeah, I like to do more episodes like that. Um, it's it's more of just like we always try to schedule guest hosts that have some different takes on it, and scheduling the right hosts for different issues is difficult. Oh, um, I'm sure. Yeah. So, 
So we have many other topics planned. It's just a matter of, you know, getting the right person on who can really do a good job of representing things that me and Charles, my co-host, you know, might not know as much about. Mm -hmm. So that's called Eternally Bored. Anything else you wanted to talk about? Uh, Well, um, how did you get started in your podcast? So for me, I I wanted to do a board game blog and I wanted to write about and do written reviews because I wanted to. I wasn't seeing a lot of the kind of review content that I that I wanted to read. I didn't like the kind of standard review process for board gaming where it's a lot of explaining the rules. I wanted it to be more like movie criticism, which is something I'd been interested in. And then at some point I'm like, hey, this podcasting thing seems popular. Maybe I'll throw that in there. And then we ended up loving it. So it continued. <laughs> uh, we started after PAX last yeah, year. Yeah, PAX East and 2017. We were, we were just like, we played tons of new board games. Let's sit down and talk about the the experience. Yeah, well, I'd kind of planned because I had the mic uh, and I bought the mic and I'm like, okay, maybe I'll try the podcast. If not, maybe I'll try streaming something. And then it ended up being a whole lot of fun, which is good because it's a nice break from when I have frequent writer's block. (laughs) Can I just jump in and kind of ask about the process of designing a board game? Let's say you have an idea or a concept. How do you kind of take that and flesh it out into an actual game and then at what point does the developer come in and how do you collaborate on that well so i think it works different ways every time (laughs) so that's like your non-answer to your question because (laughs) so like when i come up with a game for instance sometimes i've started with a theme first like arjun actually started with a theme and then i added the mechanic later it actually came from a dream i had a dream about like a different elemental mage colleges uh, warring together with different abilities. And then I just added the mechanics on top of that. But Harvest definitely was the opposite. I, I was like, I'm going to make Agricola in, you know, 30 minutes. And that was like the entire idea. And I just went from there. So that was more mechanic based. So, you know, it can, it can work either from theme or from mechanics. You can have a great idea for a mechanic and build a theme around that or vice versa. And then as far as like the development, it just, it depends on the publisher. You know, I've worked now with TMG and I've worked with Level 99 and they're like almost opposite experiences, except like, I think they're both great companies and they're both run by great people. But, you know, Brad, the owner of Level 99, he is like, really hands-on with his games and so he was actually the developer for both argent and imperial and you know he we are like in constant communication we talk all the time every couple of days especially during this kickstarter project we're talking all the time but even when we're not in the kickstarter we're talking constantly and working on the game together whereas like tmg basically they assigned or they hired seth on as a developer for uh harvest and then it was just basically me and seth and Seth is not even an employee of TMG. At least he wasn't at the time. He was just contracted. So I never really talked to TMG, like, at all. I just talked to Seth. And, like, me and Seth basically developed the game together. And then, you know, he just went to it with the final product. He went, he brought it to TMG, and then they published it. So, like, very different experiences. So I guess it can, there's a good, probably going to be a wide variety of experiences, just depending on the publishers. Those are the only two I've worked with. But I'm assuming, based on those two experiences, every publisher is going to work pretty differently. Yeah, it's just, it's always interesting to hear, like, how people come up, what their creative process is and how they get from an idea to, you know, a polished, finished product. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, what was the impetus for the the co-op game, the asymmetrical one? Was it just, was it like, I want to make Spirit Island even crazier with asymmetry? Was that the starting point? It was actually, the the funniest thing, and it's probably not even going to ring any bells in the um, final version of the game, but the first thing that inspired me to design it was Love Letter, because um, the first mechanic, and I'm actually changing this mechanic, actually, one of the races is still going to have this mechanic, but Love Letter, you have two cards, and you play one of them. That was, like, the mechanic behind it, and then I was like, oh, maybe I can develop that into a larger game, and I kind of ran with that, and it actually, the final version of the mechanic became closer to Gloomhaven, and I was playing a lot of Gloomhaven, and uh, so it was more like uh, you use two cards, one for the top, one for the bottom, that, you know, core mechanic of Gloomhaven. And that's the one that it ended up going into the into the prototype, although I've since changed it, and now there's only one race that does that. And so now every single race huh. plays their cards differently. So there's one race that plays their cards like Gloomhaven, and every other race plays their cards in a totally different way. So that's 
it's just becoming it's kind of like sprawling like and becoming more and more asymmetrical as i design it and so like you know it's probably not going to be as different as vast because there are some core principles that each race has um you know they all use attack and defense in kind of similar ways just at different rates and different values but uh you know they're they're they play very very differently already and i just kind of leaned into that as i've been designing it but the as far as like the theme and the overall idea that was probably more inspired by spirit island because you know i love spirit island and the idea of like a really like um interesting heavy co-op game uh, i think is a really good one yeah yeah i, I completely agree speaking again I'm, I'm going off topic here i i remembered just now when you mentioned that you had a dream about a design i had a dream last night you guys are gonna laugh it's the stupidest thing i dreamt that i was talking to stefan feld and he was sharing his strategies like his personal strategies for castles of burgundy and they were the same as my strategies for the Castle of, of Burgundy. And you know, I was like, yeah, I got it. And that was the whole dream. That sounds about as dry as Castles of Burgundy. Yeah, yeah. It was it was about as <laughs> like dry as, as the game itself. But I have no idea why I had that dream. Anyways, I felt the need to share that. That's interesting. I, I myself have never had a dream about Steffenfeld, but, you know, to each their own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I can't help it. It just happened. I suppose there are weirder dreams I could have had about Stefan Feld, but he, he, he just vindicated my own strategies. It's, it's great. Of course, now I, I, I remember this, and I'm like, it felt so real. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. I have the great Castles of Burgundy strategies. And I'm like, oh, wait, that, that wasn't actually Stefan Feld. You must think really highly of your strategies, Mark. I do well. <laughs> I have played I mean, the game. If you dream about your strategy, then yeah, I would say. Yeah, it's better than the one time I dreamt of a Netrunner deck idea and then tried to make it, and it was just a dumpster fire. It was awful. It was, that was no good. That was a bad dream. All right, well, let's wrap it up there, I suppose. Thanks again for coming on the podcast with us, Trey. It was a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you, thank you. It was a pleasure being here. And congratulations with Imperial. So far, in getting funded is always a huge relief. I've I've talked to some other people who are running Kickstarters and either like during it or right before it, and they're just nervous wrecks. So I like talking to people about their Kickstarters after they've been funded. It's a lot yeah. better. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm always nervous until it funds. Like you know stretch goals are great and everything but before it funds you're like is this even gonna fund and will anyone buy my game you know yeah you it's, never it's, really know. it's like Schroden, schrodinger's board game like it doesn't become real until it hits the funding goal yeah um you can, you can definitely take a big deep breath once it hits the funding goal yeah yeah so uh, congrats on that hopefully you hit some of those uh expansion stretch goals that'll be exciting yeah if we can get to 250 you know i'll be super happy because I'm all about asymmetry, and that's when we that's when we unlock the thing that's gonna really make it asymmetrical. Like every every company will have different player powers they can select. It's like having two sides of the board in um, Terra Mystica, like two different colors that play very differently. Yeah, so yeah, I'm yeah. Hoping, hoping we hit that. Well, for the people listening, get out and back this game so we can make it happen. Two hundred fifty thousand, exactly. or just give them like you know whatever they need if you're super rich or something. Yeah. Uh, yeah you know. <laughs> You know, it it could happen. Weirder things have happened. But yeah, that's our podcast for today. Thanks for listening, everybody. Don't forget to check out thethoughtfulgamer.com. Check me out on social media. Check out Trey on social media. And uh, if you enjoy the podcast, don't forget to rate and review it on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts through whatever program you use. And check out Trey's podcast, Eternally Bored. And if you want to watch us record these podcasts live and see, for instance, the part where I just completely blanked out and lost all words in my mind, it was just a blank <laughs> void. Because that's it, that that's exciting, I'm sure, to watch. Go to patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer and help us stay afloat with our podcast expenses and such. And that would be greatly appreciated. Plus you can you can talk to us. Oh, I forgot. There was a a comment from one of the patrons who applauded you for calling out uh, Ticket to Ride at the beginning. He says you're <laughs> now his favorite designer for uh, pointing out the mediocrity of Ticket to Ride. I would like to point out that the views of our patrons are not the views of the Thoughtful <laughs> Gamer. I very much do like Ticket to Ride. And uh, Have you played Ethnos, Trey? Oh, no. I knew you were going to bring it up. I'm just curious. 
Yeah, I actually really like Ethnos, but no one oh. in my group does. Oh. So I'm what okay. Well, no. Here's the real question: Is Ethnos very similar to Ticket to Ride? I mean, I've heard people make that comparison, but to me, not you'd, really. Like, you'd say they're wrong. You're dead to me. Uh, <laughs> Ethnos, to me, like it's all about the different powers and abilities. If you haven't noticed, I really like powers and abilities, yeah, and that's Ticket fair. to Ride has none of that. It's just like, oh, I have a ticket. Oh, let me just draft cards to fulfill this ticket. Oh, I put down the trains to fulfill this ticket. Like, what else is there to this game? Trey, I like that you just put into words the reason why Mark's wrong and I'm right on this. We've been fighting <laughs> about Ethnos and whether or not it's similar to Ticket to Ride and which one is better since PAX Unplugged. I think nearly every podcast it's come up. <laughs> well, we just great. Trey well, just put it to rest. So. <laughs> oh boy, it's my podcast, people. It's my podcast. It doesn't mean you can't be wrong about Ticket to Ride. I mean, I, I deem myself correct. I am the <laughs> arbiter of reality in this podcast. No, you know, I realize I'm in the minority, and a lot of people love Ticket to Ride. So, not to take anything away from them, but I personally just don't find anything about the game interesting. Just, my I mean, to be thoughts. honest, I there there are a ton of games I would choose above it just because it's really simple. But I think it's I think it's a very good design. Anyway, oh yeah, here's the cat for for our patrons. Oh, guaranteed thank goodness, cat, guaranteed cat appearance if you join the thoughtful gamer Patreon. It's it's a look. It's a part of the cats, deal. Cats what? are much better mascots. Our our podcast mascot is a dog. It's not my dog, but it's my <laughs> co-host's dog, and he often has to bring it to my house. The problem with that is like the dog is like constantly making noise while we're recording, and there's only so much we can edit out. So it's uh you know I think cats will make much better podcast mascots for that reason. Yeah, she doesn't make a lot of noise, mostly because by this time of night she's like fallen asleep, and then Amber comes in and wakes her up. Which is why she's cranky and biting everyone. <laughs> wow, a cat that sleeps at night? That's kind of rare. Yeah, we've got her on like a schedule, almost. She wakes up early. Did you know, like fun fact for the, the folks at home, humans are one of the only species on the entire planet that like typically only sleep once a day. Like most animals sleep multiple times a day. That's why you always see like cats and dogs napping here and there. I read an article once. And I think by now we've probably gone down to the longest closing segment of this podcast ever, which I'm very excited about. <laughs> um, I read an article, no, that, that theorized that until basically the invention of the electric light, Pe humans would have a like one to two hour break in the middle of the night. We did two separate sleeping phases. Yeah, yeah I no, did that too. It's not really a theory because it's it's kind of documented. You know, they is have it? evidence supporting it. I thought the um, the article I read said that there's some evidence of it in like literature or you know just mentioning it like in old newspapers or something. But they couldn't. And this was years ago. I could be I could be talking about it in, incorrectly, but I think the argument was that they they couldn't figure out if. It wasn't mentioned more just because it was so mundane or if it actually was like a short-term fad or something. But I found that really interesting. Yeah, there's also um, – there's a there's a method that humans can use. The problem is it's just inconvenient by, because of the way we live our lives. But you can basically like sleep every – I don't remember how many hours it is. It's like four – every four or six hours you can take like a 30-minute nap. And as long as you continuously do that – then you're fine. And the problem is if you miss even one of those short naps, like you crash and like you, you know, pass out because you're, you become exhausted like really, really quickly if you miss any of your naps. But the, the benefits of it is that you sleep less per day. So like you actually kind of gain life. <laughs> right, so right. Less of your time is spent sleeping. So it, I was, I was always interested by that. Isn't that um, called the, like the, the Uberman or something? I, I don't know. It's been years since I read the article, yeah. but I just thought it was fascinating because I was like, if I could do this, I would totally do this because I would like to have more life and more hours to spend, you know, working on things that I need to get done. But I mean, you know, human lives just don't work like that. Like there are times when you have to be up for longer than six hours and it, it so yeah, yeah. there's just n no real practical way to do it. Yeah, there were, we were, uh, us three, we were all in the same freshman hall in college. That's how we met each other. And there were a number of people from our hall who tried something similar to that. What was it, like Christmas break? I remember, remember... David was, Lewis. Did he do the it? The man, the myth, the legend. Matt who, Harris did it, too. Well, I, I'm going to tell a story about Matt Harris. 
I, I don't know about this. Go ahead. So Matt Harris tried the, the, the hard one, the one you're talking about, Trey, where you you take a 20-minute nap every six hours. and yeah, every four hours. I think. Or every four hours? Is that it? Something like that. I think it comes out to two hours every 24 hours that you sleep. Yeah. And, you know, you have to. The point is that you're training your, your brain to go into a REM cycle immediately so you get restful sleep every time. But obviously the first couple of weeks of doing that is just torture. And he came back from Christmas break, and I thought he was going to accomplish it. And he came back, and he had this just dead look in his eyes. And he looked awful. And I'm like, how was the uh, the sleep thing? And he's like, well, you get to a point where no alarm can wake you up. <laughs> and then he just walked away. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that was his failure at, at trying that. <laughs> I'm assuming it's not for everybody, even if you can make it happen for yourself. Yeah, there were there's some in between where you do like four hours at night and then like two naps during the day that seemed I, that I, I know of some people who do that. Yeah, I did a version of that for a short period and it can work at just making it work like socially is harder. Yeah, yeah, that's the problem. You have to kind of schedule your whole life around it. I don't know. I, yeah. like, I like sleeping, so I'm going to continue doing it normally. My whole problem is that I'm a night owl, but my job has me waking up at 6 a.m. So I get like five hours of sleep every night, but then I take a nap when I get home from work, and that's how I deal with it. Yeah, that it's works. Kind of, you know, it works, but by the time I, I get ready to take my nap, I am exhausted. And if for some reason I have something right after school and I, I can't take my nap, then I'm like really, really tired. So it's problematic in that way. Yeah, yeah. Anyways... We have fully embraced one of the rules of the podcast that there cannot be too many tangents, but I think I'm going to call the end there. I already did my closing spiel. Like, there's nothing more to say. I just got to, just got to, yeah. just got to. Thanks for joining it. us on the sleep podcast. Um, yeah. 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 Where we talk about we'll theories talk of sleep. <laughs> uh, happy sleeping all. That'll be my new send off there. All right. Podcast is over. Thanks for listening, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs>